Thank you. It's a real pleasure to be able to speak to you today. Um, I'd first like to extend my congratulations to IFFGD uh, for 30 years, 30 wonderful years of contribution to the field. I'd also like to thank the uh, chairs and the organizers of the Norton Education Series for the very kind invitation to speak. My name is Nikhil Thapar. I'm a pediatric neurogastroenterologist literally uh, speaking to you from the other side of the uh, planet, from the sun, sunny state of Queensland in Australia. Now, it might not surprise you if I were to say at the center of the universe was a most remarkable organ of the gastrointestinal tract. Of course, I'm going to say that because I'm a gastroenterologist and I have to justify my existence. But perhaps you would be surprised if I were to suggest that the first and maybe most important brain that exists within the body is not within the head, but within the gastrointestinal tract. Now, indeed, one of the largest nervous systems that we have within the body or the enteric nervous system um, runs the entire length of the gastrointestinal tract. And this is a remarkable nervous system. It is huge. It is, uh, has the same number of nerves that you would expect to see in the entire spinal cord. It has the diversity of neurotransmitters and chemicals that you would see within the brain, the central nervous system. And its importance is not only in coordinating, for example, digestion and absorption of nutrients or excretion, but as you will hear across a number of talks in this education series, it's really important in coordinating crosstalk, for example, with the microbiota within the gut, with the immune system, and with the brain itself. But perhaps one of the most important functions of this enteric nervous system is in terms of motility. And that is really the propulsion of the contents of the gastrointestinal tract in a very coordinated fashion along the length from really the mouth down to the anus. And this function of motility is critically important for all of the other functions, because if you can't move the contents of the lumen, then of course you can't digest or absorb food and the crosstalk with the microbiota or the immune system will also get affected. And where this motility function or this uh, propulsion of luminal contents is affected, we call these gastrointestinal motility disorders. So really it is a failure of part or all of the gastrointestinal tract to propel its contents through what is an unobstructed lumen. So there isn't something which is blocking the gastrointestinal tract, but it's a failure of the function of motility. And why do we call them primary gastrointestinal motility disorders? Because the main effect is on the machinery of the nerves and muscles. So I've already talked to you about this large nervous system, but of course this nervous system provides instructions to the muscles, which cause contraction to push the contents along, and also their specialized cells known as interstitial cells of Cajal or pacemaker cells, which are also critically important. And depending on which one is affected, we can also name these disorders. So if smooth muscles are affected, we call them enteric myopathies. Where nerves are affected, neuropathies. And where these interstitial cells of Cajal affected, we call them mesenchymopathies. So what are these primary gastrointestinal motility disorders? Well, there are a number of them and they occur along the length of the gastrointestinal tract. And they affect variably the different components of the machinery of the neuro, neuromusculature of the gut. So therefore, if you look at esophageal achalasia, this is a destructive process where the nerves um, within the esophagus or the swallowing tube are destroyed, both within the body of the esophagus, as well as the valve which sits, or the sphincter which sits between the esophagus and the stomach. This is an acquired process. It occurs after birth, um, and we don't really know what causes it, although the implications are possibly of genetics and possibly of some viruses 
which may ultimately lead to the damage of nerves. If you move down into the gut, into the stomach, we see a number of children that have gastroparesis. So this is not only where the stomach can't empty properly, which you may see disturbance of accommodation, so how it holds, for example, a meal after you eat, and also you can see sensory disturbance where we start to see symptoms like nausea or fullness coming from the stomach. And again, for the majority of cases, we don't really know what causes the gastroparesis, and it can really affect all parts of the machinery. Perhaps the most severe of these disorders is in intestinal pseudobstruction. I am going to talk a little bit more about this. So it is severe because it affects the main part of the bowel, which is important for nutrition, the small intestine. Now, again, this can affect any part of the machinery, so nerves, muscles, or the interstitial cells of Cajal. Perhaps the best uh, recognized condition is going to be Hirschsprung's disease. So this is a disorder of nerves. It's the birth defect where nerves or the enteric nervous system fails to um, uh, develop in a variable part of the end bit of the bowel causing obstruction to the flow of contents. More recently, we've started to uh, recognize children that fail uh, to respond to the normal treatments that we use for constipation and we recognize that some of them really have a motility dysfunction within the colon and we call this slow transit constipation and again it can affect nerves muscles or the interstitial cells of cow and finally the complex sphincter uh, that sits um, at the anal opening can also be affected both through its nerves or muscles now, if we look at these conditions, the majority of them are relatively uncommon or in fact rare. So if you look at intestinal pseudobstruction or achalasia, we're really talking about uh, one in 100,000 um, children. Now, most of these conditions have unfavorable outcomes, and that is because the treatments that we are able to apply to them are very limited. In most cases, we have to go for surgery. And most of them are going to really have effects on the quality of life. And in the main, this is because we have a poor understanding of why these diseases occur. And also we have a relatively poor understanding of the actual pathology that is present within the gut. So we can then target effective treatments. Now, of course, I can't cover all of the motility disorders within this talk. So I'm going to focus on intestinal pseudobstruction to give you some insight into some of the work that is occurring currently to try and improve the outcomes of these severe gastrointestinal conditions. So a few years ago, we brought together an expert group from across the world. We couldn't bring together everyone, but we brought representation from across the world to start to address this condition of intestinal pseudoobstruction. So one of the problems is that there was a considerable amount of variability in how people diagnose and manage these conditions. So we were trying to bring forward recommendations so we could start to standardize the care available for this severe condition. Now, one of the first things that we addressed is really the classification and understanding of this disease. Because until now, or very relatively recently, intestinal pseudobstruction has really been thought to be a spectrum that starts in childhood and goes through to adult life. But when we looked at pseudobstruction, it was very clear that in children, it appears to be a very different disease from adults. So in children, it's generally a birth defect. It directly involves the nerves and muscles. You often get bladder involvement. It tends to be quite rapidly progressive with most of the children requiring artificial nutrition. Whereas in adults, it tends to be um, acquired, so it occurs much later on in life, it tends to be secondary to conditions such as cancer, it tends to be slowly progressive. So the first thing we suggested is that we should really deal with the pediatric or childhood pseudoobstruction very differently. So therefore we now call this pediatric intestinal pseudoobstruction or PIPO, which in many respects is quite child friendly, friendly in itself. We looked at diagnostic criteria. Can we improve 
the diagnostic criteria that we apply to its diagnosis so everyone has been able to make a much better and clearer diagnosis of this very devastating condition. So of course, um, we did look at some of the clinical uh, pictures, such as the inability to maintain adequate uh, nutrition. We looked at the fact that most of these children are going to have x-rays, and therefore we can look at the distended loops of bowel. But the main thing we added to the diagnostic criteria is that really we now have an objective measure that the small intestine nerves and muscles are affected. And this could either be through testing the bowel or looking at the tissue or using things like genetics. Now, in terms of looking um, at the function of the bowel, the test that we apply um, is manometry. So we place a specialized catheter within the intestine, which has specialized sensors along its length, which can measure the contractions within that small intestine. And here we can see a, a young friend of mine with a catheter placed within the small intestine. She's lying on the bed very happily uh, watching television, and we can record very accurately the contractions occurring within the small intestine. And this is an example of the kind of tracing that we might see with these big stomach uh, contractions, and then these very coordinated contractions moving down the intestine. And this is a very normal study. We have now high resolution manometry, so we can get a better idea of the anatomy that we're actually looking at. And this is something that is used much more extensively, for example, in the esophagus when we're looking at esophageal achalasia. Working with our surgical colleagues, we now have better techniques to access tissues. So we can actually look at the tissue. Um, so they can use minimally invasive techniques such as keyhole surgery to give us good uh, samples of tissue and then using um, standardized techniques to actually study the tissue, we can more accurately look at the defects that are present within this tissue to understand what exactly is the issue. Of course, genetics has seen vast improvements. They're much easier to apply, so we can actually look at genetics easier in children with uh, pseudo-obstruction. But saying that, in the vast majority of cases, we're not going to actually find the obvious genetic cause. But I suspect that in the years to come, we're going to be able to apply these genetics tests much more easier and actually get better information on the genetic causes of conditions like um, pseudo obstruction or indeed any of the motility conditions. What about management? Well, if we actually look at intestinal pseudo obstruction, unfortunately, we don't have a cure for this condition, and most of the management is really going to be supportive. Like any of the motility disorders, um, the prime um, uh, reason for the prime management strategy is going to be to provide nutrition, and that is to try and uh, preserve growth and development uh, within these children. We try and limit the symptoms and the progression of the disease, so although we can't cure it, we try and stop the disease from actually getting worse, and eventually, we're trying to actually improve quality of life. And one of the ways that we do improve quality of life is to try and prevent the considerable complications that, for example, may be associated with intestinal pseudobstruction or the treatments that we apply to it, such as the use of artificial intravenous nutrition. But one of the most important things that we recognize is that for a lot of the more complicated uh, maternity disorders, you really need a specialist multidisciplinary team. So one of the recommendations that we made very strongly when we looked at pseudo-obstruction is that really the children with this condition should really be managed by a dedicated hospital-based team that has multiple disciplines within it that have a really good understanding not only of the condition, but the tools and requirements for really accurate diagnosis and most um, optimal management. So they can really use a whole range of tools to manage these complex conditions. Now, of course, one of those is going to be nutrition. So for example, when we deal with children with pseudo obstruction and we look at nutrition, we see in a very stepwise way how we can actually um, try and in, keep them with oral feeding. So strategies to try and keep oral feeds, maybe by using more liquids than solids, lower fiber solids. If that doesn't work, 
and perhaps stepping up to use of uh, stomach tube feeds and trying different feeds within the stomach to see whether they are better tolerated because we have evidence of this. And if that doesn't work, then perhaps trying feeding directly uh, into the uh, intestine again with specialized feeds. There's been some uh, progress with the use of certain drugs such as octurtide to try and improve the tolerance of feeds. And really only then, if all of this has failed, to use parental nutrition. Now, parental nutrition has really been um, a lifeline or continues to be a really wonderful treatment for a lot of these children. And the improvements in parental nutrition have really allowed them to enjoy a quality of life, which is really excellent for many of these children. What about drugs? Well, unfortunately, in pseudo obstruction, um, the use of drugs has been fairly limited. So we, yes, we can suppress the overgrowth of bacteria that does occur. If inflammation is a cause, we can address this one. But in terms of trying to improve the maternity, the effects um, can be quite variable. So for example, if your muscles are severely affected within the intestine, there are limitations to what drugs can actually do to try and improve the function of the muscles. So really the mainstay of treatment of conditions such as pseudo obstruction or indeed across the board for the uh, primary maternity disorders has really been surgery. And in pseudo obstruction, we really recommend uh, surgery in all of the, the patients. This could be to improve the feeding through uh, the placement of feeding tubes, but primarily is to try and prevent the big dilatation of the bowel that occurs. And as you, the bowel gets bigger, it loses function. So really, um, uh, we ask the surgeons to place ileostomies, for example, which can decompress the bowel and try and maintain some of the, the function, although the overall um, management is to try and minimize the number of surgical interventions. Of course, in some of the children, they start to get complications from the treatments that we apply. And in some of the children with the most severe disease, um, we do refer them on for intestinal transplantation. And again, the last decade or so has seen considerable improvements in the outcomes of children from treatments such as intestinal transplantation. But the real secret here is choosing the patients um, very early on in life and starting the dialogue with transplant centers. So what does the future hold for children with fertility disorders? Well, I really do think that in the next 10 years that we are really at the cusp of many improvements. I think we are starting to um, move towards getting a better disease understanding. We have good tools for diagnosis. Uh, we can access the tissue a bit easier. And I suspect that's going to allow us uh, to start to understand the disease and also improve the diagnosis. We have technologies that are evolving. And therefore, if we improve the diagnosis, for example, we may be able to target medication uh, more accurately. So we know which children we need to apply medicines to. We have good technology. So we know, for example, that in conditions like gastroparesis, electrical stimulation of the stomach can actually uh, improve the function of the stomach and also the symptoms. There are innovations in surgery. So if you look at achalasia, and we're now moving even away from keyhole surgery to surgery we can carry out um, you through an endoscope um, with good early results, um, but this needs to be replicated in other centers. But I think one of the biggest things that we are working to do is to really standardize the care. So no matter where you are, that the same diagnosis and treatment gets applied to try and improve outcomes. I want to also share with you some exciting news to say that in the coming years that there has been really good progress with stem cells. So for example, with um, conditions that affect the nerves within the bowel, we have now successfully, a number of uh, groups, including in the United States, have been able to um, harvest stem cells um, for nerves. These can generate nerves. You can then inject them into models of disease to actually show functional recovery. So we're really now at the cusp of being able to apply this within the clinic or at least start some of the early trials to see whether this might be a successful strategy. But of course, we still need to come back to a better understanding of disease so we know exactly what we need to treat. So therefore, in summary, 
what I've addressed in this talk is, is really looking at what are considered a more rare and heterogeneous group of disorders with, with overall a, a severe uh, clinical outcome. The diagnosis in these conditions needs to be uh, timely, needs to be accurate, it needs to be definitive, and we're certainly moving much more towards this. Um, you need clear criteria for diagnosis, and you need access to good motility testing, um, like manometry or indeed um, strategies such as tissue assessment. And these, in many cases, are better served in specialist centers. The management at the moment for these conditions is largely supportive, again, best uh, served in specialist centers with expert multidisciplinary teams. Um, the mainstay of treatment is going to be uh, surgery, all those strategies like nutrition, the use of medication, and in the most severe cases, transplantation for pseudobstruction are still applied to these conditions. But really, I think we are about to embark on an era where there may be improved diagnosis and the application of more novel and innovative therapies. But clearly within this severe group of disorders, there's lots left to do um, and lots of positive initiatives required. And with that, I'm going to thank you for your attention. Thank you.